I had been waiting to do a video about Elizabeth Warren's insane new crypto bill that she introduced. Um, I was waiting to see if someone would really break down what this thing is about. And so far in the crypto community and the crypto press, I have not seen anybody really engage with how insane and Orwellian and dystopian this whole thing is. And so I'm doing a video here. This is going to be a short video. I'm going to purposely keep this punchy. If you have questions or whatever, you can always reach out to me. But I want you to be able to watch it multiple times because what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to talk about this new bill that Elizabeth Warren has introduced that is not a joke because it basically has 20 co-sponsors on the bill, 20 sponsors in the Senate of the U.S. The Senate only has 100 members. So one-fifth of the total members of the Senate are co-sponsors of this bill, okay? And it only needs a majority to pass. So that's the first thing. It has a very good chance of passing. The second part is, and what I'm going to show you in the second part of this video, is I'm going to show you that what this bill fundamentally does is it criminalizes doing math. And this video that I'm doing right now, if this bill passes, this video is going to remain up. And what I'm going to show you in this video, because I'm going to show you the code, uh, an example of code that would be criminalized, and I'm going to share that in the description of this video. This video that you're watching right now, if this bill passes, will get me potentially between five and 10 years in federal prison. Okay, so it's serious. Please watch this. It's insane. I don't know that it can be stopped. I'm not saying reach out and tell your 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 senator or your congressman because I, I think we've reached a point now of just complete insanity. But what I know is this is so insane and so absurd, and I refuse to comply with this. I absolutely refuse. So that's what I want to say. So please, this will be punchy. It'll be quick. I'm going to show you this, but it needs to be done. If anything, please share this with the people that you know, especially people who are in the crypto space, because no one seems to understand what this is and what's going on. Let's begin. A couple of weeks ago, Elizabeth Warren announced that she had a whole bunch of new, you see five new senators join as co-sponsors, including three members of the banking committee, uh, expands coalition of banking committee support for bill cracking down on crypto's use in money laundering, drug trafficking, sanctions evasion. It does not do any of those things. This bill does not do any of these things. As a matter of fact, what I'm gonna show you today is it criminalizes my use of the number one. The number one, it's going to criminalize me using the number one and doing some known mathematical formulas that are available to everyone in the public and that are used every day. It's gonna criminalize that. Like I said, I'm going to do it right here. So here's the text of the bill. Okay. It's called, it's Miss Warren, a bill to require financial crimes enforcement network to issue guidance on digital assets and for other purposes. So the FinCEN, the fi Treasury's financial crimes enforcement network has been issuing guidance on digital assets for 10 years now, since 2013. The latest one is 2019. You could look it up, FinCEN guide. just Google FinCEN guidance, CVC 2019. Really what this does here, so she calls it the Digital Asset Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2023. There's nothing in here about money laundering. So there's some definitions that we'll come back to. It does one thing in terms of law, right? They are lawmakers. So it does one thing in terms of law. It adds to the definition of a financial institution in the United States code, in the US code, in the statutes. So it says section 5312A2 of title 31 of the United States code as amended by this section of the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020 is amended. So basically what it does is it says, strike subparagraph Z, make subparagraph AA subparagraph BB, and then we're going to add this. Th these are going to be the new people who are considered to be financial institutions. Unhosted wallet providers, digital asset miners, validators, or other nodes that may act to validate or secure third-party transactions, independent network participants, 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The most important part, there's, there's three. I mean, you've got your nodes. So it makes nodes. If you're a node operator and you run a node, it's going to make that uh, you're a financial institution. If you're a miner, you're a financial institution. The most important, I think, because those could be potentially businesses, right? These miners. The most in important thing, it's wrong, by the way, but the most important one that's brand new is this. And it's something that has been exempted up until now for good reason, because it's absurd. Unhosted wallet providers. Okay, so we need to look, they make some definitions of what is an unhosted wallet. Unhosted wallet provider. So it's a provider of an unhosted wallet. What is an unhosted wallet? The term unhosted wallet means, this is important, software or hardware that facilitates the storage of public and private keys used to digitally sign and securely, trans and securely transact digital assets such that the stored value is the property of the wallet owner and the wallet owner has total independent control over the value. So these are non-custodial wallets, crypto wallets, the ones where you have your own keys, not your keys, not your coins. If I, as a software developer, which I am, produce and distribute software or hardware that is a wallet, which I do, by the way, I also am the maintainer of open source code for an actual node implementation that has a wallet in it, but I have multiple instances of code that does this, then you become a financial institution. Okay, so we will come right back to this because it's important it's important to know that really what we're talking about is it's software or hardware that facilitates the storage of public or private keys. You can stop it there. The rest of it is just what those public or private keys are used to do, used to digitally sign and securely transact digital assets. Okay. But really what it is, is it's any software or hardware that facilitates the storage of public and private keys that could be used to do that. It's important to understand what a public and a private key is. I said the number one, the number one is a private key. In this case, the storage of the number one, if I produce a piece of software that stores the number one, I become a financial institution. So where, what is it? Yes, it's that crazy. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna prove it to you in code and you can run this code yourself, okay? So what does it amend? It amends this. Section 5312A2 of Title 31. Okay, Title 31 is here. Okay, Title 31, Records and Reports on Monetary Instruments Transactions. 5312 is the definitions. Okay, so it said 5312A2, A in the subchapter chapter 2. It's going to add to what a financial institution means. A, an insured bank. B, a commercial bank. C, a private banker. D, an agency. So we've got credit unions, thrift institutions, broker dealers and securities, investment bankers, a credit card system operator, an insurance company, a dealer in precious metals, a travel agency, a money transmitter, a telegraph company, a a casino that with annual gaming revenue of more than a million dollars, right? So these are financial institutions. It's going to add unhosted wallet providers to this. Okay, what does that mean? What does this title 31 in subchapter two, what is it saying? What is this? So what it is, as you see here, is it's all about records and reports. This is about KYC, know your customer, AML, money laundering, keeping records that you have to have an insane amount of information about everyone who's transacting certain transactions. Now, an unhost your, your, your cryptocurrency non-custodial wallet provider actually can't keep those records because as it says itself, Unlike every other financial institution there, the stored value in the unhosted wallet definition, the stored value is the property of the wallet owner and the wallet owner has, the wallet owner has total, the person running the software, not the producer, has total independent control over the value. Total independent control over the value means I can't even see it if I gave you the software. 
That's like me being the producer of a safe and you're requiring me as the producer of the safe to be able to tell you what's in everybody's safe that bought my safe. It makes no sense. Now, if it was more, if, if the technology involved was more than just literally doing math with the number one, then maybe we could talk about it. But that's how insane it is. Okay, so what happens if I, so what can happen? Search and forfeiture of monetary instruments. They can search me and forfeit uh, money. They can give me an injunction telling me that I have to stop producing software. There are civil penalties. The most important, and remember, I said what I'm about to do in this video, I'm leaving this video up. What I'm about to do in this video, because I'm going to produce an unhosted wallet, and I'm going to share that code because of how absurd this is in the description of this video. Now, what happens? A person willfully violating this subchapter, and by the way, I'm not keeping any records or a regulation prescribed or an order issued under this subchapter or willfully violating a regulation prescribed under section 21 of the FDIC Act shall be fined not more than $250,000 or imprisoned for not more than five years or both. Oh, and if they wanna drag me out and say that I was also violating some other law by doing this video and presenting you with this software, Oh, that's going to be a uh, fine not more than $500,000 and imprisoned for not more than 10 years or both. So this is dead serious. These people may be useful idiots. This may have just been written by the banks. But it, this is dead serious. Okay, so. The term unhosted wallet means software or hardware that facilitates the storage of public and private keys. Well, this is redundant because if you store the private key, you generate the public key because the public key is a number that you get after doing a particular mathematical function, mathematical calculation on the private key. What is a private key? Well, for all intents and purposes, it's a number, period. It's just a number. And some people are like, oh, it's a very, it's a very big number, a very big random number. No, it doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be. It's, it's got a certain size in memory. And we're gonna talk about Bitcoin and Ethereum because they use the same public and private keys. You can, use, you can use your private key, your Bitcoin private key, you can use it on Ethereum and vice versa and public key. It's the same thing. So you only need to create it once, you could use it on either network, okay? But what is it? Well, in both cases, it's a 256 bit number. It's a 32 byte number because there's eight bits in a byte. 32 byte number. So it takes up 32 bytes in memory. What is a 256 bit number? It's an integer, okay? So it's any, here we go, 256 bit computing. The range of integer values that can be stored in 256 bits is, okay, the maximum value unsigned, meaning it's positive, it's just not negative, is written in decimal as this. See this long number? or approximately 1.1579 times 10 to the 77. So that means there are, after that one, there are 77 zeros, okay? This is a gigantic number. To give you some perspective, they estimate that the number of atoms in the known universe is 10 to the 78, okay? So this is one, just one order of magnitude below that. So it's, it's, this is a huge number, but it's any number between one and this number. So that means one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Keep counting. They are all valid private keys. So when you think about it like that, what is it saying here? Software or hardware that facilitates the storage of numbers, of a number used to digitally sign and secure. But I can use one to digitally sign and securely transact digital assets. Okay, so now what I'm about to do for you right now, and then we will talk about what it is, is I'm about to right here here is the code okay where i am about to generate using the number one as my private key i am going to generate a public key and addresses for bitcoin and ethereum and i will show you exactly what that looks like right here done the private key 
See all these zeros? And then what's at the end? One. This is how you represent in what's called big Indian format. This is how you represent the number one as a 256 bit number. This is the public key that you get when you use the number one as a private key. This is the Ethereum address. And this is the Bitcoin address. And as you can see, I wrote it right here what I did, generate a public key for the private key of number one. So what do I do? I make a 32 byte buffer, 32 bytes in memory. And then I write into that, this, the number one at the last position. And then I get the public key and then I'm showing it here on the console. And then all I do to get the Ethereum address is I do a known mathematical function, a hashing function, known mathematical function, and I take the last 20 bytes, the last 40 characters, and that's my Ethereum address. And I'll show you that I can do this here, node. I'll show you right here with Ethereum. I'll do Ethereum, just the Ethereum code by itself because this is so insane, okay? This is all it is. This is all it would be. Four lines of code using public, well-known. These libraries are available and they're used for all kinds of things, not just cryptocurrency. If I do ETH only, okay, here's my private key. It's one. Here's my public key. It's this. Here's my Ethereum address. If I take this, I can just go back and right on the web, I can use that There's a little online tool, take off the first byte, okay? Go to, I'm gonna find it, it's, I'm looking for 7E5F4 on there. Because remember, I'm just taking the last 40 characters. Here it is, 7E5F4, that's my Ethereum address. That's it. And look, if I go to Etherscan and I put that address in, because you may be like, oh, you can't use number one. You couldn't use number one. Here, I think I put it in there too many times. Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, people play around with this address all the time. There's been 3,300 transactions in here. There's three, th the last transaction was two minutes ago. The first transaction was sent, what is this? 2,556 days ago. Is that like nine years ago? Like eight years ago. So basically almost at the, since, since like 2015, the second year of Ethereum existing because people know, and I could use number two, I could use number three, That's Ethereum, that's Ethereum only. Bitcoin is a little more advanced. I have to do a few more things. I do a double hash of another thing and then I do a little checksum and it's nice. But still, this code, this wallet code, because here's, so here's the Bitcoin address. What about Bitcoin? You're like, oh, could I use, could I use the number one? as my private key on Bitcoin? Well, let's see if anybody has. Right here. Right in Blockchair Explorer. Let's see, and there we go. First balance change 12 years ago. Last balance change three months ago. There's been 1,413 transactions on this, meaning the number one is not only a valid uh, private key, it's been used many times. So let's just go back real quick to what it says here. It's going to make unhosted wallet providers, financial institutions. What is a term unhosted wallet? Software or hardware that facilitates the storage of public or private keys used to digitally sign and securely transact digital assets. That's what I just did. Four lines of code. That's what I just did. It stores public and private keys. 
And those public and private keys have most certainly been used to digitally sign and securely transact digital assets. And they're being, right as we speak, <laughs> on Ethereum, they're being used. There's something, there's something waiting, there's a transaction waiting to be confirmed. So this is the insanity. This is it. Please, please share this. It's of crucial importance. We've reached a point now of complete absurdity. Of course, this was written by the banks. And of course, the 20 senators who are being useful idiots, I hate to say it like that. I feel bad for them. Because if the, I'm sure that if they understood that what they're doing here, how what, what level of two plus two equals five Orwellian madness this is, to where they're gonna make it. Again, the things that I was doing, I was not even using cryptocurrency libraries in the code. These are not crypto libraries that I'm using here. Okay, these are these are just, this is built in. This one is built into the, to Node.js. These are, these are just public, well-known, these are just cryptographic functions. They're just mathematical functions that are known. It's criminalizing that. Sure, it's written by the banks. They're gonna be the only ones who are going to be able to afford the millions of dollars to do proper KYC AML. Unhosted wallet providers can't even do that because already, as it says, the value is in complete control of someone else. How can I track assets that I have no control over? The reason why the banks can track the, the transactions that they have is because they take possession of the funds. So this is complete insanity. Please share this. Please run this code. That's the most important thing we can do. Run this code. Educate yourself about what this really is. It's just math. It's just numbers. And they're telling you that anything that can store the number one, any software that could store the number one, if you produce that, you are now subject to potentially go to jail for five to 10 years if they decide that they want to prosecute you for that. Thank you for watching this. Again, please share. Please share.